योग कर्मसु कौशल Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Khyati Dodia, an assistant professor of English in Gujarat Arts and Science College, Ahmedabad. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, first person, Dr. Vitesh Ravia. So, on behalf of the ball bench of first RC in English, I welcome you. And uh, today, I think for almost all the participants from Gujarat, uh, there is no need to uh, introduce Ravia, sir. Uh, but i am glad to introduce i am uh, glad to give a brief introduction about ravya sir to the uh, my other group members dr hitesh ravya sir is a professor and head in department of english ms university baroda he is also a chairman of a board of uh, english language and literature in faculty of arts he is appointed on a special duty as a director of communication skill officer at msu baroda uh, professor hitesh ravya has a, a total 23 academic years of teaching experience at the college university level including 15 academic years of pg teaching he has been serving as phd mphil guide and supervisor since 2009 he has successfully guided 22 phd mphil students He has got 32 of his research paper published in UGC recognized or peer reviewed journal having ISSN and book having as been so far he has got 20 books published from the Reno International Publishers his textbooks have been prescribed in syllabus of many universities of Gujarat and other states as well his two books namely William Shakespeare's The Tempest and A Midsummer Night's Dream have been prescribed as a textbook in class 9th and 10th respectively by the Meghalaya Board of School Education however i'll try to make up it uh, look i think most of the faces are known to me and you know it very well that my expertise is english language education in india and elt in particular so these days you know uh, i am working on english education in india and you know there are many questions in our mind because all these years uh, the historical perspective of english language education what is english education uh, what is the importance of english literature everything has been taught to us rather it has been planted in our mind uh, through british uh, lens so i think uh, since it is a refresher course and when i came to know that most of the teachers are teachers of english at the collegiate level i think that uh, it may be a reputation for some of the teachers but i would like to uh, speak on revisiting english education in india now uh, you may say that sir we are already teachers of english we have done our b english m english we have phd nat slat so there is no need to understand but personally i feel that there is a lot to understand so far as english language education in india is concerned Uh, look uh, most of us we know it very well whenever we talk about english language education in india we talk about macaulay right and we talk about the way in which uh, english language everything was introduced in india but there are many concerns about it look the first lesson uh, i think uh, recently i delivered a similar lecture at the kcg government of gujarat as well so my first concern is that as a teacher of english you must understand that english language has not been you know like uh, planted the way in which we have been told if you really look at the historical perspective you realize that after the arrival of britishers you know english language was very much there in india look when it so uh, my basic plan is that uh, that i'll just give you a very brief overview that how english language education was introduced in india and particularly in the context of our 21st century what is the relevance of english so far as society is concerned so we know it very well and most of you know it very well that britishers came in 1600 and for 200 years as such there was no question of english language education in india and uh, we know it very well particularly only in the 17th century particularly after the uh battles of plassey and when india was ruled by mughals in the 18th century so that was the time you know that for the first time uh, you can say at the end of the 17th century or maybe in the beginning of 18th century the question of whether english should be introduced in india or not that was discussed among britishers so the first lesson if you know i am very happy but if you don't know i would like you to break the myth that you have in your mind that it was macaulay who introduced english language education in india i think as teachers of english we must understand that it was not only lord macaulay you know 
even people lord macole there were many attempts uh, we know it very well we know the contribution of raja ram mohan rai as well so uh, my point is that so my first part would be you know to give you very briefly maybe in 15 20 seconds uh, that overview of english language education in india so look uh, uh, as i told you that after the arrival of britishers you know for 200 years there was no question of use of english because it was already uh, out of question in the sense uh, that most of the uh, most of the time britishers were busy in political uh, settlement company rules so it was only before 1800 so you can say that there is a gap of almost 200 years after the arrival and for the first time the question of english language education was discussed so we can conclude that it was only at the end of the 18th century for the first time britishers realized that it is a high time that native should be given english language education so you can understand that almost 35 to 40 years before lord macaulay this discussions were very much there but then you should also understand that what was the agenda of english education so the first agenda that we know it very well that they thought that to create respect for european now this is very interesting we should know that we had a rich heritage of culture we had a rich heritage of knowledge we had vidya peeth so much so but at that time they realized that since india has a rich heritage of knowledge you know the history of nalanda and everything right the way in which moguls have destroyed our vidya peeth you must understand that even before the world had idea what is university even the concept of university thousands years back we had our own university we had established education system so everything was very much there so their primary objective was that that if we preach english may be introduce english and if we plant the idea in the mind of indian people right that whatever you have been learning whatever knowledge you have that is very you know primary the real knowledge is the knowledge of science the real knowledge is the knowledge of light so with this political agenda they thought that we must introduce english language education so that is point number 1 and second point obviously was uh, religion right because uh, they thought that if they want to preach christianity the only way is through english so with this two political uh, agenda they introduced english language education in india so uh, as such you know like uh, whenever we talk about uh, macole but i think i request all the teachers that you must read you must read this historical uh, document that is called observations on the stage of society among the asiatic subjects of great britain particularly with respect to morals and the means of improving it uh, you will be very happy to know that at present uh, one of my student is doing phd on uh, on this topic and this was this document was hidden you know that means for many centuries at least i don't know i mean i have no hesitation whatsoever to confess that i came to know about these documents only two years back and that also uh, during the covid period where i could retrieve this document from a british library so this is the first historical document you know so we can say that it is the first blueprint of english education in india and i think uh, uh, this is a very common question that is generally asked in the net exam also you know that which is the first blueprint of education so we should know that observation which was published in 1792 is the first blueprint of english language education in india so look at the time period uh, your macole is 1930 uh, 1835 whereas this document is 1792 so there is a gap of almost 37 years plus the preparation of preparing this document if you think about the mental process so we can trace that english education was very much there even even even, even you know uh, 50 years before macaulay i don't mind telling so so you should know that observation and now we'll we'll see that between uh, 1798 to macaulay there were many uh, schools i mean uh, yeah i think it's visible so like uh, this is primarily uh, the text i would like to focus so in this text a policy to bring about change in indian society moral social and mental through english language western education 
and Christianity. So this, these were the three objectives for them. And that is why, you know, uh, this uh, document is very crucial to understand because even in the context of national education policy, I think all the teachers must go through this document because this is the first historical document in which you have discussion of English language education. So what it says. So uh, in 1792, the Charles Grant, who was the director of East India Company at that time, he brought this uh, blueprint. But the most interesting part is that that even before Macaulay, you can see that English language education was very much there. So this is the beginning, 1792. So you have to unlearn your history, right? Uh, all these years, whenever we talk about English education, we begin with uh, Macaulay, that is 35. But it's from 92 to 35. And you can see that there were many schools. Like, for example, we had Christian schools. Then we had Calcutta schools in 1819. We had Jainara, Khosal English schools. Then you had Banaras English schools, then your Bishop's College. So, point is that there were many English medium schools. Uh, missionary already started entering in the beginning of the 18th century, and there was a lot of campaigning by the Christian lobby for the demand and the spread of English language education because the primary objective was also to spread uh, Christianity. So, now this is very interesting. You may not uh, like this statement of Charles Grant. Look at what he says. The true curse of darkness is the introduction of light. Now, this is very uh, problematic statement because he thought that all of us have a curse of darkness. That means Indian people are not having any knowledge. Indian people have no wisdom, no science, nothing. So look, uh, sometimes it so happened that uh, it is because of the continuous propaganda. Now we know it very well what is happening even uh, today in the society. So even personally, I feel that the word, I mean, though uh, this is not the right platform, but even at that time, he used the word Hindus, right? So point is that he said that Hindus err, Hindus make mistake because they are ignorant and their errors have never fairly been laid before them. The communication of light and knowledge to them, because he thought that all Indian people are ignorant, completely not educated. So the knowledge to them would be prove the best remedy for their children. So they were worried about our next generation. But the, unfortunately, uh, we are not able to understand the other political agenda. We have accepted English language, but still we are, we are, we are still we continue with the colonial hangover, and that is our problem. So in my second half, I would like to discuss how can we crack this colonial hangover. So he and then he proposed, you know, with full conviction that English language education should be introduced in India. So that is his official statement. And then uh, uh, he recommended primarily two things introduction of English as the medium of instruction. Now we know it very well that then it went on, right? And Western system of education that included literature, natural sciences, mechanical innovations, what we today call choice based credit system, right? Or holistic education. And then second point was adoption of English as the official language of the company. Unfortunately, unfortunately, even today, Today, English is the official language. And I don't want to argue on the national language, but we know it very well that India never had national language. And India will never have national language. So the point is that the only language which could survive was English. And then he stated that Christian faith. Now, this is very interesting. He clearly stated that Christian faith through medium of English is the only remedy for all the evils in Hindu society and for the liberation of Hindu mind. Now, these are, you can see what he envisaged, what he planted. Unfortunately, he, he has proved right because today, you know, whenever we talk about Hindu society, whenever we talk about Hindu culture, Hindu mind, Hindu knowledge, you know, some people will consider you that you are fanatic. Point is that we are not able to respect our own religion. Somehow I feel that uh, we have never questioned. Look, uh, I, I don't want to uh, bring political uh, controversy here, but even if you look at the uh, narrative of Bollywood movie, you know, it is very interesting that entire narrative of Bollywood movie is always against Hindu culture and Hindu tradition. 
So like you know, we will pay money and we will see that a hero or heroine will make a mockery of our God. So point is that I don't want to name, but personally, I don't agree some of the movies like PK and others, you know, where we pay money. So unfortunately, you know, so you have to correlate. It is still what Grant planted, what Macaulay planted is still going on. So point is that later on we have Macaulay, we have a good discussion on that, we will have it. But my point is that now what, what can we do? Like for example, we know it very well that India is a multilingual country and it is not possible that we can go away with English language. So one thing is very clear, I am also a professor of English and I understand that today English is an unavoidable evil. We cannot live without English, particularly in the global era. So there is no question that we don't want English. It's too late. It's too late. Yes, we could have done it. We could have done it immediately after independence, uh, but uh, unfortunately we couldn't do it for information that immediately after independence, uh, there was a report that let Sanskrit be the national language. Not only that, a committee was uh, constituted and they submitted more than 2000 pages of report that in Sanskrit can be national language of India, but unfortunately uh, due to political reasons or maybe the wisdom of then minister or education minister, whatever, even uh, we never decided to have Sanskrit as our official language. I don't want to say that if India could have done it, all of us would have learned Sanskrit. But anyway, we couldn't respect our language. And then, therefore, uh, English is still an official language today. So that is the first thing. You must understand that English language was introduced for political agenda. You don't respect your culture. You don't respect uh, your own people. Uh, I have been repeatedly saying so. Uh, some for some of you, this example may be you know repetitive, but I don't mind that we are not able to even change our rhymes. You know, when you send the children, you know, after more than 70, uh, 70 years, seventy five years, right? Most of the rhymes which you have in English are typically British. I don't agree with any of the fairy tales because most of the fairy tales and most of the stories of you know fairy tales they create gender bias in the mind of the child at the at the, at the five years. For example, uh, chubby cheeks and the story of Prince Cinderella. Look what we teach through Cinderella that beauty is only outer. You know? so and when uh, the young uh, when the children who are of four years and five years. And when you uh, teach them, then what is beautiful, right? So what we teach them, you know, chubby cheeks, dimple eyes, I don't even remember because I'm not studying English medium school and I don't have any problem, right? So that is also another example that it is not necessary that if you study through English medium only, then and then you can become professor, right? So I'm very happy to share with you that I have studied in a very typical government school, right? At Bhavnagar and Varika, but uh, I think I don't have any problem. So. Uh, point is that now we're coming to the point that what can we do? We still have so much to discuss. I think most of you know uh, what happened in Macaulay and other. I don't want to go uh, down. Maybe I can give you a very, very brief idea that uh, uh, if you wish. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Then you have Charles Act. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yeah, I'm sorry. Hello. Is my yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Yes, 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 sir. I'll, I'll give you a very quick idea. Look, I, I hope that all of you know from Charles uh, uh, Charter Act, right? So then, you know, 1830, we have Charter Act. Charter Act also uh, recommended more or less same, you know, what uh, others say. And in particularly, if you look at the point, uh, Charter Act specifies that this act was, you know, taken up by Britishers for the purpose of educational development. Yes, I do I do give a credit. It's not that whatever Britishers did is bad. Look, they decided to spend money for education. That was a good action. And uh, in the uh, in this act, again, you know, by, uh, by the time it came into existence, missionaries were ready in England. Now, this is also very interesting. The missionaries were prepared. The ground was prepared. And though, remember, there was a lot of agitation in England also for imparting Western education in India because they thought, you know, that it is not a good activity. So there were certain intellectuals people uh, there as well. 
Any, anyway, we'll not go into that. So, as such, there's no, nothing much in Charter Act. The most important question that was discussed in Charter Act that whether missionary be given the responsibility and missionary be allowed to go to India for the spread of Christianity or not. But ultimately, Charter Act decided, right, that uh, they should be allowed. So that is okay. I mean, we cannot uh, change the history. That is fine. Now, another, another, another crucial point that we have to understand that after Charter Act, you know, after Charter Act, there was a lot of demand for English and English education in India. And it, because of that, you have altogether a different society. Now, if you see some of the movies like Kranti, where, you know, uh, most of the Indian people are doing job for the Britishers. Look, Britishers could rule us because we allowed them. So, and at the same time, uh, what we can say, it was a typical Babu culture, you know. So if you know English well, you are called Babu, and then you get a job, a government job, you get pension, you get certain kind of respect among the British people. So with this kind of uh, attractions, uh, because more and more employment, uh, employment opportunities were open for English educated. Unfortunately, even today, the same situation is there in India. If, if you are gold medal in Sanskrit, uh, in BA, MA, PhD, and if you are excellent communicator in Sanskrit, you don't get employment. But even if your English is partially weak, you can easily get the employment. So uh, that, that was the time. And particularly in Kolkata, people like Raja Ram Mohan Rai and all of them were very much in favor of English education. So uh, we cannot forget the contribution of Raja Ram Mohan Rai. And uh, look at the time uh, span. Raja Ram Mohan Rai passed away in 1833. Uh, and that is exactly two years before Mekole came to India. So uh, if you still blame, that Macaulay is responsible for uh, English language education in India and the way in which uh, Macaulay is uh, portrayed as a villain, you know, uh, Macaulay is somebody, you know, who introduced English compulsorily in India. I think uh, as teacher of English, you must object to this. Look, that is also a propaganda. I don't want to bring politics, but, you know, Macaulay has been portrayed villain, you know, and it has been, uh, it has been planted in our mind Personally, I don't have any problem with English education or English language. The problem is uh, the political part, British hangover. Today we can fight uh, back uh, with English, but we have to, what you can say, decolonize English language education. Or another point is how can we make our English, you know, native English. So a kind of a concept of nativism should be brought in the English language education. And there is absolutely no need to uh, worry about canonical tax like Pilgrim's Progress, Paradise Lost. Look, we have to remove this tax from our syllabus. This is the high time, you know, and you should have a list. There are many researchers who have made a good research that how English language or the course of BA or what you can say BA English was introduced in India first. Not only that, some of the textbooks were planted, prepared, especially for the colonized people. So when you read those textbooks, you feel that in the entire world, the best language is English, best religion is Christianity, and the best people are Western people. So point is that one religion, one country, one nation was planted through literature. But unfortunately, unfortunately, even today, we are not able to go away from it. Like, I really don't understand, and I would be very happy if somebody can uh, reply that, that Still, there are hundreds of canonical texts. Look, what is the objective? What is the objective of MA English program today? Personally, I feel it is no longer MA English. So all of us must understand that it is English studies. Personally, I feel it is Department of English Studies, or Department of English and Cultural Studies, Department of English and Comparative Studies, but it is certainly not Department of British English or, Brit, uh, or what you can say Queen's English. So, because our students, our students don't uh, require, you know, the knowledge of the history of the Europe. Try to understand. Most of the textbook, the syllabus, curriculum, design, we are still following it. I have 
Look, uh, I, I saw in faculty of arts, you know, Maharaja Sayaji Rao Initiative of Baroda, and for your information, the faculty of arts was earlier Baroda College. So it was established in 1881. And, and I, I have, you know, because I, uh, from archive, I could get the prospects of Mumbai University. So imagine at that time, you know, our, our college, 8081, I'm talking about 8081, almost 200 years, right? 8081, it was Baroda College, which was affiliated to Mumbai University. I still have the copy of the syllabus of the first year of BA of Baroda College. When I compare the syllabus, I feel very, you know, pain that some of the texts we are still continuing. We don't know. We don't know why we are teaching Ben Johnson, right? We don't know why we are teaching Pilgrim's Progress. We don't know why we are teaching some of the texts, which is like, for example, comedy of manners. Try to understand. Our students' requirement in the market is different. So if we continue teaching English, literature or MA English or ELT, whatever you call it, right? Ultimately, our students will suffer a lot. So personally, I feel that the first step is to I'm not saying whatever is uh, from British is not good. There should be a balance. There are many good texts. There are many good writers. There are many dramatists. But we should be selective. We should not just pick up any text. For example, I remember when I was doing my uh, bachelor's degree in Sardar Pate University. At that time, I studied the te uh, text, The White Devil. You know, now, uh, whenever now when I look at myself, I said, really, what was the meaning of the text White Devil? So unfortunately, unfortunately, we have prescribed several texts in the syllabus which has no relevance in our to today's Indian society. Those textbooks were, uh, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Neha Aroraji is talking about Harish Trivedi. I think uh, there is no comparison, right, with Harish Trivedi ji. And uh, I'm very uh, lucky that I have listened to him. So he also talks about him. Maybe you will find some of the influence of Arish Trivedi ji, and even uh, there are many others like Kapil Kapoor ji, they are all talking about it, that there is a need to decolonize English language education in India. Uh, you'll be very happy to know that I attended one uh, conference, decolonization of English language education in India, way back in 2002-03 at Patan, when at that time also, Professor Makran Paranj, Dr. Kapil Kapoor, Dr. Professor Arish Trivedi, all of them were there. So I, I do think, uh, so that we will definitely uh, be talking about the syllabus. So point is that, that you have to understand that so these are the historical perspective. Now coming to Raja Ram Mohan Rai again. So uh, you, you see that Raja Ram Mohan Rai wanted English very badly. He, he was very clear. So to blame Macaulay or Britishers, that is also problematic because uh, look at this, according to Macaulay, English was needed to modernize Indian minds. But look, he was very clear. He wanted English to modernize our mind. And modernize Indian mind means not should good, you know. And he also wanted to nourish the growth of Indian thought. And he wanted English as the language of education, as the medium of instruction, so that Western morals and values and English edu education of science can be uh, imparted. So, Indian leader Raja Ramon Rai, they were uh, urging, they were requesting the countrymen to study English language to acquire the knowledge of Western science. There is no doubt about it. That if you talk about the contribution of uh, Britishers, the biggest contribution that they could connect us to Western science. And we know it very well that today in, to in 21st century, uh, almost everywhere it's Western science. However, it is again a debatable subject that many concepts, many ideas, which were originally Indian once upon a time, now they have turned into Western science, but we will not go talk, talk about it. So Raja Ram Mondai wanted liberal mind, he wanted translation, and he was in favor of English education only as the instruction on a permanent basis. So. Uh, in short, even Raja Ram Mohan Rai was very, very harsh in criticizing Sanskrit system of education. He was against Sanskrit part Shala. He was against Sanskrit education. So there were many people like Raja Ram Mohan Rai in India who were in favor of English education. And the most important thing is Hindu college. Hindu college was opened in 1870. It was the first college which was established by the fund of private people. 
for your information hindu college was not established by britishers you must remember this that it was established by raja ramon rai and some bengali people they collected the money and they started the college so the objective uh, since it was a very patriarchal society uh, you may not like the objective to instruct the sons of hindu not daughters or not the children to instruct the sons of hindus in european and asiatic language and science so this was the primary declared object of the foundation of hindu college to instruct the sons of hindus in european and asiatic language and a proposal that lecture should be delivered by english professor means professors from abroad was made in 1825 so by 1825 they decided that they will have visiting professors from london and such lectures were given in 1827 in 1834 captain richardson he was the young officer from bengal army with a strong bent of literature he was a poet he was made principal so this is very interesting history before you have macaulay speech you already have hindu college an english medium college first self finance college i will call it because it was established without the support of then government britishers by this time number of students had greatly increased and you, uh, even uh, you know the fees was introduced etc and you can imagine in 1835 there were 884 students today many arts college in india do not have 884 students at that time in in hindu college there were 884 students so point is that raja uh, raja ram mohan rai was successful in establishing and to give you one more idea that it has become you know an accepted dictum you know it has been again planted and you know that the lord macaulay is the one who is but actually look lord macaulay came at a time when it was right everything was prepared the ground was prepared and therefore he simply submitted the minutes you know he was executive officer right so he submitted the report but we cannot conclude suppose suppose macaulay would macaulay wouldn't have submitted his minutes do you think there won't, there won't be english then english would have continued so point is that macaulay came to india for the first time in 1834 and began in 1835 he wrote his famous minutes but before that you already have calcutta school you already have committee of public instructions you already have lord minto you have already charter act you already have observations you already have the uh, committee of the public instruction of 1831 uh, and you already uh, educate liberal education already started in bengal in 1816 then 1835 so one of the objectives of uh, this presentation and this lecture was that i want to break that uh, idea in your mind that macaulay is responsible for education now the next question then why why this observation is not available in public domain uh, very soon it will be available because i am at present i am writing a critical note on that you know if you read observation you know you will hate britishers because so many uh, things which i cannot tell you about hindu hindu culture religion everything has been written in this document this document uh, was not available for a public at large thanks to archival that now this document is available to many people anyway so uh, this is what i wanted to discuss now whatever i have discussed so far right i don't want my lecture to be teacher centric we, we, before we shift to the second part right if you have any question in your mind i would be very happy because i feel that uh, in orientation program the orientation can takes place only by answer your questions so i am all of your uh, very well learned teachers of english later on also you can uh, read i just wanted you to give you a way out they try to read more you know just don't don't believe any book of elt you know where uh, english before pre independence and they will begin their journey from 1835 no actually so much is there to explore and it is an unexplored area right so if you have any questions please feel free to ask otherwise gradually we'll move to the next stage how can we uh, nativeize i mean how can we decolonize it that is the second part yeah uh, any question or anything sir uh, this is shonjati yeah yeah 
yeah am i audible yes very much yeah sir you know this centrality of macaulay regarding uh, the introduction of english is primarily because not that people were not thinking about introducing english because there was a debate between the anglicists and the orientalists yes yes so anglicists like charles grant existed but also there were people like william jones and h h wilson who wanted uh, indians to be educated in persian and uh, sanskrit but there was this two groups and nobody was emerging as supreme the centrality of macaulay is primarily because he clinched the deal in favor of the anglicists exactly. and the yeah. government or the the colonial government adopted english and forever there will uh, you know it was regarded that english will remain the medium of instruction henceforth as long as the british empire existed and he of course yeah. envisage that the empire will continue in the form of english language which it still does but uh, the idea that there was uh, i mean the english education was very much available in the colonial power centers of yes, Africa, yes. mumbai i bombay yes, and madras much before macaulay yeah very true but you know that is the irony because you know uh, if you look at the most of the books and you know uh, even in upsc syllabus the the journey a history of english begins with macaulay only nobody discuss raja ram mohan rai nobody discuss observation nobody do, apart from charter act so point is that and you know we blame macaulay that he is responsible so that is my point is that macaulay is was not responsible look i personally i feel even if you wouldn't have presented minutes that there won't be any change i mean situation would have remained the same for us yeah that is the concern so it was it was the time you know it was the need of the time maybe not 35 maybe 37 38 like that uh, any other question uh, any observation not necessarily question yes sir yeah well yeah please can you hear me sir yeah okay uh, so in your presentation uh, you talked about the introduction of english uh, actually what happened uh, english was introduced during the british era that's okay but in the post independent era uh, english has been appropriated and that's why today we have the genre indian english okay. and uh, official communications are still going on in english can we think that english has become a part of indian literature or indian languages And that's why okay. communication in English is uh, not a colonial hangover, but not in an Indian language. I got your point. I got. I got your point. Look, okay. I I do I do agree with you. Look, my my problem is that uh, particularly for the teachers of uh, English, right? That even even in the number one, I would like to make it very clear that English is. the official language of india today there is no doubt about it because india never had national language then and india never have national language today hindi is not our national language and hindi cannot be our national language that is also a fact whether you like it or not and uh, recently also there was a controversy by some of the famous film stars and many teachers and sometimes even many uh, so called uh respected people of india also they don't know that hindi is not our national language or what you can say rashtra bhasha it is a raj bhasha so one must understand the difference between rashtra bhasha and raj bhasha and that is why when you visit bank state bank of india they always say hindi hamari raj bhasha hai unka upyog kijiye something like that my point is that so that is very clear now second point we have two official language hindi and english that is also a fact on paper but you cannot so when there was a lot of language controversy it was decided that those states or uh, those community who have problem with english right uh, and sorry hindi and if they don't want to learn hindi because you cannot force you cannot force suppose my mother tongue is gujarati right you cannot force me there i must learn hindi Ah, okay if i wish i can and particularly from south bell it is almost impossible so with lot of rational lot of thinking it was decided that english will be official language language of the law today you know it very well most of the high court you know not most of all the high courts of india whether it is punjab high court or mumbai high court gujarat high court language of law is english so you have to submit your writ petition in english only i cannot submit writ petition in gujarati and visit gujarat high court the judge will say sorry so that is number 1 now coming to the 
colonial hangover. Look, why colonial hangover? That there is absolutely no problem that you give a lot of importance to English, but not at the cost of Indian languages, Indian culture, Indian thoughts, and our regional language. To give you one example, look, in most of the syllabus of bachelors or masters, it may, it may be from Maharashtra, it may be from Kolkata. Look, you don't find your own people in the syllabus of BA. So our problem is that we, whenever we prepare the syllabus, whether it is UGC or UPSC, I have a problem with UPSC as well, because I am not very happy with the UPSC main syllabus of English, because it is still a colonial syllabus. So you have traditionally, you know, William Shakespeare, Dramatis, Victorian era. Where will you place Indian English literature? Where will you place uh, uh, Indian English uh, in translation? Where will you put your cultural studies? Where will you put your regional language? So look, for example, I am from Gujarat. My first duty is that and I'm very happy. I have introduced one paper at bachelor level. That is one Gujarati diasporic literature and another uh, Gujarati literature in English translation. So I, I look, if my students are from B English, they are from different states like Rajasthan, Bengal. So they should know who is Javarchand Meghani. They should know many, many writers from Gujarat. They have worked wonderfully. So point is that all of us, all of us believe, right, that Shakespeare is the greatest dramatist of the world without reading Kalidas. The problem is that when you ask students, when you ask teacher, according to you, who is the greatest dramatist of the world, then they will say William Shakespeare. Then you ask another question. Have you read Girish Kanna? Who is Girish Kanna? Have you read Kalidas? No idea. Point is that without reading dramatist of your own language, your own regional language, mother language, other language, you don't have any knowledge of any drama. But still, you go tomorrow in the classroom, ask third year BA student, who is the greatest dramatist of the world? It is my promise to you, 90% students will say William Shakespeare. If you ask about uh, who is the great, which are the best poet, they will say uh, Coleridge, John Keats, Byron Shelley, problem, or Matthew Arnold and T.S. Eliot. I don't have any problem. They are good poets. Point is that we, we have a lot of translation in English, regional translation. If we don't promote our own tra uh, translation at the undergraduate level or bachelor level. So point is that this is the second point. How can we decolonize English language education in India? Look, I uh, personally believe that there is, we can also decolonize demos. For example, look at the syllabus of Foundation English. Most of the initiatives have Foundation English, which is compulsory core paper at the undergraduate level for BCom, BSc, BBA, Pharmacy. And then here also you find William Wordsworth. I don't see any relevance of teaching Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, or any poet, at least in the Foundation English. Because Foundation English is not for teaching literature. Foundation English is to develop listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and to develop English language. Here problem is that there also we are not we are not able to justify that let's have one one essay written by our own people. If it is suppose suppose uh, uh, if it is Maharashtra, there can be a good essay on Ajanta Ilora Cave. If it is Gujarat, there can be a good essay in English about Ginnar or Kutch. If it is Bengal, whatever, you know, each state, they have their own cultural heritage, their own arts, fine arts, you know, painting. So actually, it is a very good way that look, all of us decide, you know, at least I have decided that, you know, I, right now we are uh, I'm in one of the committee of scope. That is a program by government of Gujarat. I have proposed that there, we should prepare at least one textbook in which you don't find even English name like Bill, John, Mary. Look, even when we ask exercise, you know, that time also it is typical, you know, we still believe which is the best book of English drama, Ren and Marty. If you really ask yourself, see, English grammar has changed completely, but we are not able to come out from David Green. We are not able to come out from uh, Ren and Martin. Look, Ren and Martin at that point of time, they were good texts, but I don't think that in India, where you have thousands of professors, teachers, right? Many, right? Many have written many good books of grammar, communicative grammar, so much. So 
you know, uh, this love for Lennon Martin, love for David Green, love for Lagvi Kazamia, that is the problem, you know, because everything has been planted in your mind that the best book of the history of English literature is Lagvi Kazamia. Though it has not been revised for the last 70 years, no problem. But Lagvi Kazamia is the best. So this kind of, you know, thoughts, which sometimes even English teachers also carry, because ultimately students uh, learn from the teachers. So point is that somewhere we have to create this awareness that is not only about British, you know, India, like for example, if you ask, that we, uh, can you give me one definition of poetry? I don't want, I, you just have that answer in your mind. That if I ask this question, that which definition of poetry you remember right now, tell me. More than 70% teachers or 70%, yeah, I was expecting that only. Poetry, Wordsworth, agree? Now, this poetry is a spontaneous, overflow, powerful, feeling, regret, blah, blah, blah. Okay. When, okay, how many of you have uh, heard the name Mamat? Honestly, if you don't know, it's fine. You know, Mamat, you know. And if you don't know, I don't mind because I don't expect that, you know, Acharya Mamat, right? Acharya Mamat is a great scholar and he has written one book. Kavya Prakash in Sanskrit and that book is available in English as well as in Hindi as well as in Gujarati. The entire book, so Wordsworth has given only one definition whereas Acharya Muhammad has written the book called Kavya Prakash in 11th century. Where? 11th century and according to British culture, according to British literature, 11th century is a dark age. Your renaissance came into existence in 14th century. So when you talk about renaissance, according to British concept, renaissance is revival of learning and revival of knowledge. And what was the revival? The revival of the knowledge that was that in Greek and British. So look at the contrast. All, all of us, whether you are student of Gujarati literature or English literature, we remember William Wordsworth and one definition. Whereas in Mammat, I, I request all the teachers to read Kavya Prakash by Acharya Mammat. It is it, it must it is available in uh, public domain as well. And if it is not available, I request all of you to buy that book. It is 11th century textbook, and the definition of poetry, what is poetry, characteristics of poetry, you know, everything about poetry. If you want to really understand, if you are teaching poetry. And if you have not read Mammar, I think you are doing injustice to teaching of poetry. Such a beautiful textbook. But the textbook is lost. Why? Because Britishers never wanted us to know that there exists Acharya Mammar, right? Who has defined poetry, characteristic of poetry, heart of the poetry, everything, right? So my point is that Indian, when you talk about Indian aesthetics, right, we don't have much time. Otherwise, you know, uh, Personally, I feel that we are also doing injustice to our uh, critical theories. Like uh, when we talk about Bakrokti, Dwani, right? In Indian poetics is required. How many universities have prescribed Indian poetics in the syllabus of criticism? Very few. Very few. And not only that, when you prescribe, there will be resistance. Look, we can prescribe Plato. We can prescribe Aristotle. We can prescribe Longinus. None of them are English critic. Don't forget that. So we are doing injustice to our own critical, uh, own critical theorist. Because Plato, Plato has never written in English. So if you argue that it is English criticism, and so you have critical theories from all over the world. Even, even your Lacan is not English, right? So you begin from Plato and up to Lacan, I'm not a man of theory, right? So I don't know much, but I know the Plato, Aristotle, and then if you go to F.R. Lewis, T.S. Eliot, or Lacan, whatever. Nowhere, nowhere you will find Indian aesthetics. Why? Because if you read, then you realize, oh, it is old wine in a new bottle. If you read Indian aesthetics, you will realize that it is old wine in a new bottle. So point is that if you read Kavya uh, Prakash, then you will you will feel Wordsworth has not done anything. So if you have paper, uh, look, uh, I think Ushaji, you are from Kutch University. 
and for your information wherever i go i have introduced indian studies so before joining ms university i was in kutch university from 2009 to 2030 even in my department i have prescribed so anyway so uh, we, we were discussing about decolonization so that is the decolonization of mind is necessary as an english teacher we have a golden opportunity and particularly uh, national education uh, policy nep 2020 has strengthened our hands because I, uh, if you read holistic education if you read uh, promotion of indian languages look there is a separate chapter on nep 2020 which talks about promotion of indian languages so if you are in board of studies if you are at the place where you can bring the change in the syllabus you should say that nep 2020 says that promotion of indian languages at all level is necessary your vice chancellor and head of the department will be very happy because you can show it to the net that our syllabus is as per nep 2020 and all of us are required to change the syllabus so under the pretext of nep i think this is the golden opportunity for us to break that you know colonial hangover in the syllabus i don't have any problem with english english language is essential today somebody asked me english language is the language of india look language belongs to one who speaks language dies language grows today more than 137 countries use english today you have more speakers of english than native speakers even in london nobody uses rp received pronunciation because only we indian people try to speak english the way in which they speak they don't bother they can convert our mumbai to mumbai they can convert our khamba to khamba right so they can change name of any city and we are very happy but we must speak the way in which british speak personally i feel that is also is to be you know discarded you cannot very few some by training by so much of practice you may you may achieve near native speakers competence or what you can say nine band in ilts listening speaking reading and writing right but that may be rarest of rare it is not essential that we you know we force or we rather you know torture our students that you must speak english the way in which i mean we should try nothing wrong right i i'm not i'm not against it but it should not be considered as you know uh, a sign of uh, ignorance or lack of knowledge look even nobody uh, they don't bother right they, do you think they ever try to speak gujarati hindi or marathi the way in which we speak no so when they ruled india they never bothered about our language so why should we bother you know whether it is a spelling whether it is a pronunciation so we have now indian english or what you know Uh, adam tankarvi is a gujarati poet he has written a very good uh, book called gujlis gazal you know so it is gujarati english or something like that so in short each region like for example if you go to south bell like tamil nadu coimbatore you know they have their own typical accent so nobody can stop it you know language is our skin we cannot if i am if i am gujarati and if if you are in gujarat some of the gujarati people will come to know that i am not only gujarati but i am also from saurashtra though i left saurashtra in 1994 i, I left bhavnagar in 1994 but even when i speak english if you are from bhavnagar or saurashtra you will come to know that yes sir is from this region why because language is our skin we cannot uh, we cannot go away with our mother language mother tongue right l1 so there is going to be you know influence of l1 to uh, l2 that's very so i i i fully agree with usha ji that we it is use of indian english anyway uh, this is what i wanted to say uh, I, i still have so much but if you have any question i will try to answer my uh, uh, answer your query uh, in that context yeah i'm i'm reading some of the messages uh, i'm not able to reply all of you but very okay give me two minutes anupama ji yes uh, look we must rooted to our culture that you Yes, we have four hundred years of history of Indian writing in English, and we can have the paper entitled "History of Indian English Writing in English." I think we have more than four or five papers. We, not only Indian English. Look, you can have Gujarati literature, Hindi literature, Odia literature, Malayalam literature, like Malayalam literature in English translation, Gujarati literature in English translation, 
in the literature in english translation then you can have diasporic literature also right right so objective is that at least 30 to 40 percent i don't i don't want you, you to say that you remove shakespeare but you think of employability skills think of academic writing think of digital uh, platforms look our students when they go out personally i feel there should be one paper on film studies one paper on academic writing one paper on indian english so you have to think about it and most importantly is 21st century skills whatever the syllabus in english gujarati engineering mathematics chemistry whatever if we are not able to relate our syllabus to the market what is what they require you know our students at least my students only 10 percent students of my department will go to teaching rest of them will go to digital market blog writing newspaper reader journalist so where is our market our students after doing their masters where should they go so we should jot down the points we should like for example uh, if uh, they are ma english if they are appointed as editor or maybe the you know uh, junior editor in times of india or indian express can they write a good article that is a question so proofreading newspaper article. so ask this question suppose your students don't get a job as a teacher in school suppose our, our students don't get a job in college or any teaching job and still we want them want to give them a good bread and butter so where are where they will be employment uh, employed by google by uh, by uh, media agencies uh, content writing academic writing translation you know today translation is also a good business if you know french and japanese and english you can earn 50000 even if you are not having any uh, permanent job you know uh, we we have advertised uh, uh, teaching post for japanese french german we don't get teachers so point is that uh, along with english right if they have a knowledge of one foreign language they can do so much okay anyway uh, again i told you i want uh, student centric so if you have question or if you ask something i'd be very happy to uh, reply you please let's build three any question no if you don't have any question it's very surprising Okay, sir. Can then you hear me? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, uh, let me discuss something about, again about uh, national language. Uh, so we have this debate going on regarding national language, and some of the film stars also entered into this debate. And you, in your presentation, said there had never a national language in India. So yeah. don't you think this absence of a national language uh, is actually a uh, 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 the pride of India, because India is a uh, federal state and uh, we have diverse culture. So can we think That's that... Uh, 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 please, please carry on, sorry. Okay. So can we think that this absence of uh, a national language is actually not a barrier, rather a merit in India, uh, considering the point that India is a federal state, uh, India is a state uh, where uh, multiple languages exist, and also multiple communities of belief. So what's your take on regarding uh, uh, national language? One, yeah. Number one, look, uh, we know that India has hundreds of dialects and language. If you talk about basic, you know, scheduled languages, there are 22 scheduled languages, right? And unfortunately, not today, even before, India never had national language. For information, even Sanskrit was never the language of the mass. Sanskrit was never the language of the common mass. It was a Prakrit. So the historically, uh, geographically, and culturally, India is so I mean, India is so multilingual. You know that there cannot be one language. And one more thing, uh, the, you know, uh, if you talk about uh, Hinduism or Hindu, right? We are always tolerant, and we have never imposed anything. So the moment you uh, talk about national language, suppose we have only two options, hypothetically, though they are not going to be, but hypothetically, the only two options is Sanskrit and Hindi, right? In, personally, I feel, I, I don't know, maybe after 50 years, English maybe, you know, 
but absolutely not Hindi and Sanskrit. Hindi, we know it very well that immediately after independence, uh, there was a movement, right? There was a proposal to make Hindi as a national language, but because of the resistance from South Bank, and genuine, no, I will not use the word resistance, because of the reservations they had, right? Because, uh, like, how can you impose a particular language on, uh, on a particular people? So it was decided that it will be an official language, the language of communication. So, I and the, as time will go, like, for example, as I told you that immediately after independence, perhaps we would have prescribed either Hindi or English. At that time, perhaps it was possible, whether by force or whatever. But today it is impossible. And therefore, I don't see any hope for official declaration of national language. But yes, gradually English and Hindi, they are enjoying the place of national language. English is not our national language. Hindi is not our national language, officially, legally speaking. But they are enjoying the place. Like most of the communication that takes place is either Hindi or English. So uh, maybe time will be time will come. But still, I think that for the next 30, 40 years, I don't see even if you uh, I have visited most of the states in India. Look, there are there are many states in India where you cannot communicate with Hindi. People don't understand Hindi. Hindi is not there. So it's very problematic, you know, because we have such a diversity that there is not a single thread. There is not a single language and therefore when some people argue that look at Japan, where medium of instruction is Japan, look at France, it is French language, look at Russia, sometimes I laugh, sometimes you know, I feel that what these people are talking. There cannot be comparison of India with Russia, India with France and India with Japan. Look in Japan, there is only one language Japanese. In France, there is only one language French. In Russia, it is only one language Russia. So they may afford, they may afford to teach through their mother tongue. Why? Because English can be learned side by side. Try to understand what I'm trying to say. Suppose in primary education in Japan is through Japanese language. It's okay because they learn English from standard fifth. If you make teaching of uh, primary education through regional language, that means the children of India will learn in more than 30 languages, at least 20 to schedule language, you know. So one student from Bengali, Bodo, Dogri, Gujarati, Kannada, Kashmiri, Kokani, Maithili, Mulyal, Telugu, Urdu, Tamil, Sindhi, imagine what kind of children we will have. So therefore, and they cannot communicate uh, with each other. Like I don't know Bodo language, I, I don't know Nepali, I don't know Urdu, I don't know Punjabi. So point is that in India, we don't have a single language that can be used even for education. And therefore, in higher education, we have English and gradually we are shifting to English. Whether we look at NEP as proposed for the promotion of Indian languages, but it is very difficult. You know, no. Uh, look, look at the market. Everyone would like to know English. Everyone would like to study in English field schools. Why? Because English is bread and butter. English is international language, English language, uh, one cannot deny the importance of English language. So if I know Japanese and Gujarati, I have no value. I am a Gujarati, right? A proud Gujarati. Suppose my Gujarati is excellent and Japanese is excellent. I will not get employment. But if my English is good and I know Japanese language, I will get employment. So try to understand, English is a subsidiary skill. Even if you talk about UNESCO, you know, UNESCO has identified 10 soft skills. That if you want success in your life, you must have these 10 skills. Out of 10, two skills. One, effective communication skills in English, and another, basic use of ICT. Whether you are in chemistry, physics, English, businessman, teacher, whatever you are, if you want to be successful in your area, professionally, whatever, you must have a good knowledge of English and you must have good skills of ICT. Imagine. If you don't know how to use Google Meet, how will you deliver a lecture? How will you attend the lecture? And you know, you ask HRDC people, they find it very difficult to uh, sometime, you know, to get good resource person. Not because uh, there are no many, there are many resource person in India today. They say, if you invite physically, I will come, but I will not deliver lecture online through Microsoft Team or Google. I have seen in my own department, so like, for example, this refresher code is on. So nothing wrong. Look, if you reach at a particular age, then it's very difficult. But point is that 
without ICT and without English, nobody will survive, right? Yeah, so I think let's read some of the comments because they are also very crucial. Uh, Minakshi ji, yes, one minute. Uh, as we are in multilingual, we cannot have one language throughout the land. I fully agree with you. Uh, then your engine, yes, sir, that's what we want. We want the growth and use of every language in India. Uh, that is going to be right. And then Krishna ji, changing the mindset can only be yes. Changing of mindset is very crucial. It is very difficult to learn, but it is very difficult to unlearn. So our problem is that, first of all, we have to unlearn so much. Look, writing on a blank slate is very easy. Writing on a blackboard is very easy. But if something is already written on the blackboard, to remove it, to clean it, and rewriting is difficult task. So problem with English is that, you know, this colonial handover, respect for white, respect for British, everything is so much in our blur, you know. Because of Chubby Chicks, you know, Cinderella, look at your all fairy tales. All fairy tales are full of uh, gender bias. Most of the fairy tales, your Chubby Chicks tells the children that beautiful girl is someone who has a long hair, white skin, blue eyes. We never teach that beauty of heart. Somebody who is good in work, someone who is very courteous, somebody who is very obedient. So we don't talk about the characteristics of good human being. We talk about the body part. And that is Western culture. In Indian culture, we always appreciate the soul. We always appreciate the heart. We, our definition of good, bad, and beautiful is mind, beautiful mind, beautiful heart, beautiful soul, not beautiful body. But their concept is body and therefore more, look at your uh, like uh, I don't know many stories but the story of princess where he wanted prince you know prince prince will ride the horse and you know so the, uh, most of the stories personally I feel compared to that why can't we have Panch Tantra in English why can't we have Niti Shatak look we have several uh, what you can say the stories for the children in our Indian culture excellent stories they bring, they, they, you know, develop the character. They talk about virtues. You learn, but we don't prescribe the Panch Tantra is there. Most, so many Upanishads, these and that. But we don't prescribe those stories. We love O. Henry. Even in foundation English, the common BBA student who have nothing to do with English literature, we don't teach, we don't even prescribe the story of Indian writers in the syllabus of foundation. I think it is my uh, request and I have taken up uh, this as a challenge that I want to remove all canonical writers at least from foundation English. Please don't give them trouble of English culture and English language both. Because particularly in rural colleges, I have visited, you know, Maharashtra. If you visit village, you know, students don't know how to write their names. So point is that foundation English for FIBCOM, FIBA for other students, BPA, where our objective is to teach English. And we prescribe such stories, such poem, King Ozymandias. I don't understand. Why should we prescribe a poem like uh, King Ozymandias or the Puli or the Tiger, you know? So all, because those stories have no relevance. Our students cannot relate themselves to those stories in culture. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, sir, for such an informative lecture. It is very inspiring and amazing that how we can revisiting uh, English education in India. And we are really glad to have a resource person like you in our uh, refresher course. Your presence and experience gave more meaning to it. And we definitely look forward to having you again in our next series. Thank you so much for being with us.